Good morning. What a great time of worship. Amen. It is good to be together with the Faith family. So Pastor Tim is up in Bayfield this morning, and so he is at, preaching at First Baptist Bayfield. So First Baptist Bayfield is a sister church, part of the collective that we're a part of, and so uh, Colby up there needed a little break, and so pastors need that from time to time. We all need that, don't we? We all need some downtime. We need a little bit of a break, and so, so he had asked Pastor Tim if he could come and preach for him. So he's preaching up there this morning, and so y'all are stuck with me today, and so it is good to be with you. It is good to open God's Word, and so we're going to do that together, and so we are going to continue marching through our text, and so First Peter chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 19, and so if you have your Bible, grab it, go ahead and open it up, you know, and I say our goal here is always to drive you to the Word of God, that you would be Bereans. Paul said the Bereans took and searched the Scripture for themselves, right? That we, that you, that I would be Bereans, that whatever we hear, whatever that comes at us, we would then go to the Word of God and we would search it for ourselves. And I don't care if that's reading the newspaper, listening to Fox News, listening to whatever, wherever your source is, that you would take it, you would hear it, you would go to the Word of God for yourself and say, what does the Word of God say about this? This is how we truly have a biblical worldview, Amen. So when I say biblical worldview, that says that we would look at the world around us, look at every encounter, everything that we come in contact with, and look at it through the lens of Scripture. What does Scripture say about that? Because the world wants to tell us something that's not biblical, doesn't it? For the most part, those things, the news, the things that it says, we want you to believe this, is not coming from a place of biblical authority. And so our heart at Grace Hill is that you would have a biblical worldview and you would check even what gets preached here out of this pulpit with the Word of God. So open the Word, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew right there in front of you. If for some reason you're here today and you don't have a Bible, take that one with you. That's, that's a gift from Grace Hill Church to you. So we've spent a good bit of time in the book of 1 Peter, haven't we? We've been here for a bit. We've made it to chapter 4. And guess what? We're going to talk more about suffering today. Shocker, right? So I guess I hadn't, you know, I've read First Peter before, but I hadn't really spent this much time digging in as we dig in and realize that really it's about suffering. The Apostle Peter over and over again is talking about suffering. As we just sang, right, we just sang that ultimately Jesus is the one that suffered for us, right? Is that we worship the King of Kings, we worship He who suffered on our behalf. So in comparison, our suffering is fairly minor, but as we look at suffering, the Apostle Peter continues to unpack this theme, this theme of suffering. So as I thought about suffering this week, I first thought, thought about maybe I need to at least define it. So as I define this word, the Greek word used in our text is pathema. So Strong defined it as something undergone, a hardship or a pain, and an emotion or an influence. So it could just be emotional, right? Sometimes suffering is that. It's sometimes just emotional. It's not something always something physical. Sometimes it is. Sometimes suffering is something physical being done to us. But sometimes suffering is strictly emotional or an influence. The Webster 1828 Dictionary defines it as the bearing of pain. Inconvenience or loss. It said pain endured. Distress, loss, or injury incurred. As sufferings by pain or sorrow. Sufferings by want or by wrongs. It's a broad topic. So the idea of suffering is not isolated to one type of suffering. You know, sometimes we think suffering is strictly physical. Like I physically incurred these damages or this wound. But suffering is a very broad area, especially as we define it. So my guess is that as you think about suffering, there are some things that come to mind personally, right? So as you think about suffering, there's something that you're feeling personally, something you've undergone, something you've experienced, perhaps something this week, perhaps something this morning, some form of suffering that you've endured. The bearing of pain was part of the definition. For example, raising kids, there's some bearing of pain, isn't there? The birthing of children, bearing of pain. Then the raising of children, bearing pain. So I thought when our children were little, there's a lot of physical pain, right? Exhaustion y'all are experiencing. 
Not a lot of sleep goes on at night. You're exhausted. Now, as we're raising teenage girls, it's less physical and more emotional. There's a lot of emotional pain raising teenage girls. It's part of the experience. Loss or injury incurred, the physical loss of a loved one. You know, in our community, lots of loved ones were lost during COVID. You know, the Navajo Nation lost family members at a much higher rate than other parts of the country. There was a huge loss of loved ones. Suffering by want or by wrongs. Sometimes we suffer because of our own sin, don't we? And sometimes we suffer because of the sin of others. We sometimes suffer emotionally because of unhealthy want or desire. We unhealthily desire something, something we can even make an idol out of in our life. So today we're going to look at two reasons for suffering. I believe in this section of the text, the Apostle Peter unpacks these two causes, these two reasons for suffering. I'm defining them as proper suffering and improper suffering. My guess is that the bulk of suffering that you and I experience is really falls into the category of improper suffering. If we're being honest, if we admit it, we'd say most of my suffering is improper suffering. And let me say right up front, this is not what God is calling you to. As a Christian, as a believer in Christ, Christ is not calling you to improper suffering. However, what he is calling you to is proper suffering. So if you have your Bible, let's open up 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Let's read together. Verse 12 begins, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice. And so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the godly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your word. Lord Jesus, thank you for your suffering. Lord, your ultimate suffering on the cross for us. That so many times we take your suffering lightly. But we see that your grace was a costly grace. So Father, use your word today, Lord, to teach us, to break us to transform us. Lord, as we see suffering in our own lives, Father, that you would teach us to suffer properly. Father, that we might repent when we suffer improperly. Father, teach us today. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's dig into our text and let's look at these two ways to suffer. Proper suffering and improper suffering. My purpose is to get you to press into suffering for God's will and to stop suffering for sin. So the text first leads us to look at proper suffering. So let's look first at this proper suffering. The Apostle Peter begins verse 12 with the Lord, Beloved. It's meaning to you whom I love, you whom I esteem, you who are my favorite. This is not the Apostle Peter writing a letter to some people he doesn't know or doesn't care about. I think this is important, that these are people that he has a great affection for. This is not a guy writing a cold note 
to, hey, do this, don't do that, to a group of people. No, this is a letter to his beloved, to people he knows, people he spends time with, people he has a relationship with. This is not your probation officer who's giving you a list of rules, right? He's not saying, this is do this, don't do this, so I can keep you out of jail. No, this is the people he truly loves. It's like a dear friend or a family member who loves you deeply, giving you clear guidance and warning because they love you. So let's look back at our text. Look at verses 12 through 14. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So, loved one, don't be surprised when the trial comes. Don't be surprised when it happens. When all of a sudden there's some form of suffering that comes to you, don't be surprised. Let's be honest, we're surprised, aren't we? Every time it happens, we're like, how did that happen? I can't believe this is happening to me. Life's going pretty smoothly, and then it all goes haywire, and it can happen that fast, can't it? In an instant. Honestly, this week it kind of happened while I was writing this sermon. Shocker, right? Things were going pretty smooth at work. I was writing this section of the sermon on Thursday morning. And then I took three calls in a row that jobs were going haywire. That's how it happens. And honestly, I was surprised. I don't know the cause of the suffering, but perhaps the Apostle Peter is telling us, it's to test me. It's to test me. It's to change me. It's to transform me for His glory. So why should we not be surprised with suffering? One, our Savior suffered for us, didn't He? So if they killed our Lord Jesus, how much more should the world hate us, Scripture tells us. We also live in a sinful, fallen world. So as we live in a sinful, fallen world, we shouldn't be surprised when suffering comes. We're told in Romans chapter 3, verses 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So living in a sinful world, there's going to be situations that are difficult, causing suffering. So don't be surprised. See this as a testing of your faith. Testing your character. Are we popping too much here? Is it this? Is it? Is that better? Is that? Good. Thank you. Sorry about that. We'll see if that'll stay down there now. Technology so grand, isn't it? So why should we not be surprised with suffering? We live in a fallen world. But how should we see this suffering? We should see proper suffering as a testing of your faith, testing your character, allowing the suffering to transform your character. I'm going to adjust this. I think the problem is my peanut head is too small. Let's try that and see if that works better there. So we shouldn't be surprised that we should be testing our faith so that we might be more like Christ. So what do you do when the suffering of testing comes? The beginning of verse 13 says, but rejoice. This is not our react natural reaction to suffering, is it? Is that suffering comes and we're like, yay, suffering. That's not it. Again, as I was writing this sermon, these three problems came to me, and my reaction was not to rejoice. My initial reaction was honestly to complain. I was going to complain about it. I thought, this is going to cost me money, and I don't like that. This is going to cost time and energy, and I don't like that. Most importantly, my holier-than-thou complaint was, I'm trying to write a sermon here. How dare this suffering come to me right now? That's our reaction. That's my reaction. Am I the only one that complains? No, lots of heads saying no. Good. Misery does love company, so thank you for that. You know, the Apostle Peter gives us a better solution 
than this complaining, this grumbling that I can tell you that I'm so prone to when it comes. He goes on in verse 13. But rejoice, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when the glory is revealed. So through my suffering, my fiery testing, God's glory may be revealed. Let that sink in a little bit. So if you're taking notes, you're going to write anything down, I would write this down. So in my suffering, the way I handle suffering has the potential to reveal the glory of God. That should change the way I handle suffering. That should change my perspective on suffering. The way I handle suffering has the potential to reveal the glory of God. That my suffering might reveal the glory of God to those around me. That's different than what my complaining does, right? That when suffering comes in, all I do is complain and gripe about, oh, you're not going to believe what I'm going through. Because we're pretty good at that part, aren't we? But that I could handle suffering differently, that I might see it as testing, that I might see it as transformative for my good, and that I might rejoice in that. That's transformative for me. That's transformative for those around me because they see the glory of God lived in and through me. Have you met that person? That's a sweet person to be around, isn't it? You know a guy going through cancer and his attitude has been unbelievable with a very rare, harsh type of cancer. And you're like, man, how does that guy stay so positive going through what he's going through? He's revealing the glory of God in the suffering in which he's enduring. That God might be glorified. We're told why we can rejoice in Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. We can rejoice because God is our refuge and our strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. We can let the oceans roar and foam. We can let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Why? Because the fact that God is our refuge allows us to rejoice even in the suffering. Sometimes this suffering is a testing of your faith. Look at the book of Job. If you know the life of Job, not something you would wish on yourself, amen? Not something you would wish really on any of your friends, anybody around you. Say, so if you don't know the book of Job, go read it this week. It's 42 chapters. It's a narrative. You can get that done in a week. You can do it. I have faith in you. So if you hadn't read the book of Job, go read the book of Job this week. That's my challenge to you. So here's the big picture. Job is an, un, an upright good dude. He's been blessed beyond measure. Lots of land, lots of cattle, kids. Then we get a little snapshot, a little look behind the veil, a little look behind the curtain. Behind the curtain, Satan goes to God. And he says, well, you know, really the only reason that Job is a stand-up guy, the only reason that Job worships you, the only reason this is going on is because you've blessed Job in such amazing ways. If he wasn't so blessed, he wouldn't worship you. So God says, okay. You can test him. You can try him. You can bring suffering into his life. God gives permission. We don't really like that, do we? We don't like the idea that God would give Satan permission for this suffering. But this is what we see. Job loses his children, his possessions, his health. To the point in Job chapter 2, verse 9, Job's wife says, his wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. 
But Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Job's faith was tested. He stood the test. He loved his Savior who loved him. Regardless of the suffering and the situations coming, the trials, hard trials, my prayer today is that I, that we, could endure suffering in this manner. This was a true testing of faith that God didn't cause, but God did allow. Not only can our faith be tested in suffering and God be glorified, but there can also be blessing. And I won't give you the rest of the story with Job. Again, my challenge to you is go, go read the book of Job. Go and read it for yourself and see what the outcome of Job's life was. So let's look back at our text, verse 14. Verse 14 says, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So if you're living out your faith and you get insulted for the name of Christ, count it a blessing as this reveals the Holy Spirit living in and through you. You know, there is nothing more important than your salvation. That's the most important thing. Of all the things going on in your life, the most important thing is your salvation. Where you will spend eternity. Will you spend eternity with the Father in heaven? Or an eternity of hell? This is the main thing. So there's a blessing knowing that you're suffering for the cause of Christ. That you're insulted for the name of Christ. The Apostle Peter says this by saying, You are blessed because by this you know that the Spirit of God rests on you. By this, you know that you're a child of God. So tomorrow, instead of fearing talking about your relationship with Jesus at work, or praying publicly for those who you interact with, let's do these things with boldness for the glory of God. And rejoice in the potential proper suffering. That you can recognize you're blessed to be called a son or daughter of the King of Kings. The book of James tells us the same thing about proper suffering. James 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it all joy to suffer properly. That when that suffering comes, that you're surprised by, which you shouldn't be, that you could count it all joy that you get to suffer for the king. That perhaps that's a testing, a trial that's coming to your life. It's going to allow you to change, to be transformed. Let's be honest, we don't tend to change without much trial, do we? I know I don't. Point the finger straight back here first. You know, how do you build muscle? How do you change? You go put it under stress, right? I'm not a gym guy, not a fan. If you've been around me much, you probably already know that. You can kind of tell by looking at me. Me and the gym are not real friends. But it's needed, isn't it? It's needed to go to the gym, to go undergo weight. Because when we undergo weight, it builds muscle. When we walk, when we run... It makes our heart healthier because it's under stress, which actually strengthens it. Our spiritual life is no different. Sometimes it takes getting to the end of ourself through trial, through suffering, to realize my only hope is Christ. Because if you're anything like me, without the trial, what do I do? Lean heavy on myself. Not a healthy place to be. But that we might see the value of proper suffering. That 
we would suffer for the King of Kings. That we would see it for what it is. Something that's meant to change me, to transform me. Transform me, my sanctification. Which that's just a big word that means looking more like Jesus. That there might be trials in my life that cause me to look more like my Savior. That I wouldn't be surprised by it, but I'd be able to find a blessing in it. I would even rejoice in it. Now we get to look at the other side of the coin. So the other side of a coin of proper suffering is improper suffering, right? So most likely the kind of suffering you and I deal with most. My guess is that when we think about suffering, most of the suffering we engage with, that we deal with, is really the improper kind. Self-afflicted, if you will. So look at verse 15. We're going to see the Apostle Peter tell us where this improper suffering comes from. He says, but let none of you suffer. Oh, wait. I like that better, right? Let none of you suffer. Let's do that. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. I can tell you, you just read that and you went, well, that's not me. I ain't killed nobody lately. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I haven't, haven't gone and robbed a bank. Not, maybe I'm not an evildoer. No, I don't meddle in other people's stuff, right? But perhaps I am, right? If I really look at my wicked heart, I'm really all those things, right? Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, the law says, do not murder. But Jesus says, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So perhaps you've not murdered anybody. But if you're anything like me, you've been angry. You've been angry with your brother. You've been angry with your sister. You've been a doer of evil. You've meddled in other people's affairs, not to their benefit, not because you love them, but to their detriment. Folks, as a believer in Christ, we are called to a transformed life. You're not called to continue to suffer for continual unrepentant sin. Why? Because you're not called to live in continual unrepentant sin. So how do you stop suffering for sin? 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As a believer, our confession and repentance is not a one-time thing. Yes, for justification. Justification meaning Christ justified me. It's just if I'd never sinned when I put my hope and my trust in Christ alone, I've been justified. I can now stand before a holy God, righteous. Not because of anything I did, but because of His grace alone. But there's a continual process of confession. This sanctification, this changing over time. So we confess, and it's a continual thing. And I truly believe that God is gracious and that he doesn't reveal all of our sin to us at once. Amen? But in the manner in which we can handle and deal with it. That's God's grace. Is that he did in the day you're saved say, and here's all your sin ever before you. It would be crushing. I can say in my own life, it would be crushing to have seen it all at once. Here's your past sin, your present sin, your future sin. All right here. But what does God do? He reveals it to you. And He reveals it to you in different ways, right? Sometimes through suffering. 
sometimes through people that love you. Like, hey, here's a sin. Here's a sin that you commit against me, and I didn't know that you did that. Some years back, the elders, we went through an exercise. We went through a book called The Advantage. We went through this exercise, and we said to one another, these are things you do to me that, that hurt me. Ooh, anybody want to volunteer for that exercise? Not something we normally like, right? That someone says, oh, and this is how you sin against me? But we did. We went through that. And my brothers loved me enough to say, you know what? Sometimes you just look at us in a way that says we are stupid. And I said, oh, I didn't know that you knew, you knew that. <laughs> They said, you know what, it would be better if you would just tell us what you're thinking and feeling and we can work through it versus us seeing it on your face and thinking all kinds of things. I can tell you that exercise, the relationship between Steve and Tim and I got better. Did I like the idea of it? No. But my sin was revealed to me that day and I could say, you know what, that's something I probably do also to my wife. Something I probably also do to my children. Something I do to those I work with. Right? It's a common sin for me. But because of God's grace and brothers that love me enough to say, this is the way that you sin against us, I had the opportunity to repent. Improper sin that can become improper sin that can become proper sin so now it's known sin and now i might repent of it so that we might confess it because god's gracious towards us so what do you do what do you do when your sin is revealed to you when god is gracious enough to show it to you Sin that maybe you weren't aware of yesterday that you're aware of today. Do you deny it? Do you hide it? You know, my instinct that day might have been to be like, yeah, I don't do that. Yeah, that's not true. Yeah, what you're seeing is something else. That's on you. That's not me. Could have tried to just shove it, hide it. I promise it wouldn't have been transformative for me that day if I'd done that. I promise it wouldn't have been transformative for our relationship that day either. So when you're confronted with that sin, what do you do? Do you have a teachable spirit? What I mean is when your sin is revealed, or perhaps you're suffering because of sin, do you just keep on sinning? Or can you see that suffering See, this suffering is a teachable moment for you to change your behavior, that you might be transformed. So here in 1 John 1, 9, we're told to confess our sins and God is faithful to forgive. Amen? So we worship a forgiving God and He's faithful to forgive. Then we're told in James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So how do you stop suffering improperly? When you sin, and you will, right? Confess your sins to God. Find peace knowing that He will forgive you. Second, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Do you have a small group of people to whom you can confess your sins to? This is biblical. Not that you'd go around town confessing your sins to everybody, like you don't have to have a sign, you don't have to wear an A, you know, around your neck. No. But you'd have a few people that you trust, that you trust deeply, that you can confess your sins to. Not that they would placate you, not that they'd be like, well, that's okay. It's not that big of a deal. Know that now they might hold you accountable for it. 
that when my brothers now see me wounding them by a look on my face, they can say, hey, you're doing it. Because they love me. Because I trust them, because they trust me. And that I might be teachable in it, because old habits are hard to break. This is how we move sin from secret sin. When I say secret sin, secret sin is that sin that I know about, but nobody else knows, right? The darkest, most deadly of sin. Because you've heard me say it here before, it's my precious, right? I hold it, I guard it. I try to not let anybody else see it. And if anybody even gets a glimpse of it, I hide it darker, sweep it under, under rugs. But that that secret sin might be brought into the light. That's God's grace, that he takes it from darkness and brings it to the light that it might be known sin. Known sin meaning I know my sin and you know my sin. Because when I know my sin and my brothers know my sin, they can hold me accountable for it, that I might repent of it. That's a healthy place to be. That's healthy sin. Thus my suffering due to this sin will reduce. Because as the sin is reduced... My suffering reduces. This is that process of sanctification. Hear this again. You are not called to suffer because of sin. God will discipline you because of sin. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you. We're told in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12, it says, For the Lord corrects those he loves. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. We worship a loving father who does not desire you to suffer for sin, but to live a transformed life. Believer, you are called to be different. The world is going to come at you and tell you, oh, that's not sin. Oh, that's okay. It's how you feel. It's okay to feel that way. Scripture is going to tell you different things. It's going to say that is sin and you need to repent. Search the scripture. Search the word of God. Pray that God might reveal your sin to you. That it might become known sin to you. It might become known sin to those around you. That you might repent. Proverbs 26.11 tells us really kind of what we do with sin. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats folly. This is too often what we do with sin, isn't it? Like the dog that returns to his vomit, so do we return to our sin. We are called to have a teachable spirit. We're called to stop returning to the vomit of sin because God desires you to not suffer improperly. Lastly, the Apostle Peter sums up his thoughts on this section. In verse 19, he says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So there is a suffering you are called to. That suffering which is according to God's will. Trust God while doing good. Perhaps you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you're enduring suffering. You're enduring improper suffering. Let me encourage you today to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ for eternity and today. As we sang, and we're going to sing again, Christ suffered when he didn't, wasn't due suffering. Christ suffered for you all the way to the cross through his death, in his resurrection, that we might put our hope and our faith and our trust in him alone. By his grace alone, you are saved. Start there. As we move into a time of communion, maybe you need to take some time and evaluate. Evaluate the suffering in your life. Are you suffering properly? Or are you suffering improperly? If you're suffering improperly, start with repentance. 
Ask God to forgive you. The band is going to come as we move into a time of communion. Communion is meant for the believer. It's one of the sacraments. So if you're here with us today and you haven't put your hope and trust in Christ alone for salvation, just abstain. That's all right. No one's going to look poorly at you. If your hope and your trust is in Christ alone for your salvation, we're going to invite you to come. But would challenge you, before you come, spend some time. Spend some time doing business with God. That maybe there's that suffering that you're enduring, that improper suffering. Maybe take some time that you might repent. That you might see God allow you to be transformed through repentance. Repent in a way that you won't be like the dog that goes back to his vomit. Perhaps you need to spend some time thinking about that proper suffering you're enduring. That you might rejoice in it. That you might rejoice in that proper suffering. You might pray, God, show me how you would have me to be changed. Show me how you would have me to be transformed through this suffering, in this trial. That God might speak to your heart and your life. That you might rejoice in it. So spend some time with the Father. And then as you feel led, you come and you get the elements, and then we'll partake together. Let's pray. Father, Father, forgive me of my sin. Father, thank you that you love us. Father, that you discipline those who you love, Lord, that, that you give us suffering, you bring us trials. Lord, that we might be changed, we might be transformed. Lord, thank you for proper suffering. Father, for the improper suffering, Lord, Lord, that sin that that you've revealed, Lord, that we come to you and repent right now. Father, for the, that one or those many that are here today that don't know you, Father, that you would reveal yourself to them right now. Lord, you'd call them to yourself, call them to be a child of the King. Father, they'd see that the suffering, the sin, the, the things they're trying to do to placate. Lord, they might lay it at your feet. Lord, they might repent and put their trust in you alone today. Lord, we thank you for the way you love us. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.